This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. أهلا بكم إلى نشرة الأخبار من العربية. أكد الرئيس الأمريكي باراك أوباما في اتصال. American President Barack Obama called the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and reiterated to him that he will work with him as a partner in order to achieve peace in the Middle East without any delays. The spokesman of the Palestinian President Abu Rudaine said that Obama promised Abbas to work in order to reach permanent peace in the region. Abu Rudaine added that Obama has told Abbas that he was the first president to call after his inauguration. منصب الرئاسة اعتبر المقرر الخاص للأمم المتحدة حول موضوع التعذيب مانفريد نوك the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture, Manfred Noack, described Obama's decision to suspend trials of suspects at Guantanamo as very positive. He added that he is confident that the Guantanamo tribunals will be ended soon. Military judges honored Obama's demand that the trials of suspects at Guantanamo Bay Prison be suspended for 120 days. بات الغموض يلف مصير 248 محتجزا في معتقل غوانتانامو مع صدور اول قرار للرئيس الامريكي The fate of the 248 suspects at Guantanamo is still mysterious as the new president Barack Obama ordered that the Guantanamo military courts be suspended until May 20th. Obama's executive order is a step towards closing the infamous prison. Based on Obama's decision, it is expected that the 120 military trials, including the five cases against suspects accused of masterminding the 9-11 attacks, will be suspended. من بينها خمس قضايا لمتهمين بتدبير هجمات الحادي عشر من سبتمبر I think that it's going to take some time The legal team is consulting with Homeland Security I don't want to be ambiguous We will close Guantanamo prison We just want to verify some points pertaining to the constitution إلا أن البعض رجح أن هذه الخطوة قد تستغرق عاما كاملا كي يتسنى نقل عدد من المحتجزين However, some believe that it will take one year before Guantanamo prison is closed because the 248 inmates have to be transferred to other countries and a decision needs to be made on how to try them. In addition, there are many other legal challenges pertaining to the closure of the prison for several months. Hussein Shihada, Al Arabiya. Hussein Shihada, Al Arabiya. U.S. President Barack Obama plans to name former Senator George Mitchell as his Middle East Special Envoy. Mitchell will preside over the files of the Mideast peace process and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. George Mitchell has been known to be the man for serious negotiations. During the early 1990s, Mitchell served as a Senate Majority Leader who oversaw Northern Ireland's negotiations, an effort that led to a peace agreement. The former senator also led a commission to investigate the 2,000 bloody confrontation between Israelis and the Palestinians following the incursion of Ariel Sharon in the courts of the Noble Sanctuary in Jerusalem. Mitchell was the first American to head a U.S. official agency calling for an end to the Israeli settlement campaign. Mitchell also called for an end to Palestinian armed hostility. ويقدر خبراء أمريكيون في شؤون الشرق الأوسط أن اختيار ميتشيل مبعوثا خاصا للشرق الأوسط. According to U.S. experts on Middle East affairs, the appointment of Mitchell as special envoy to the Middle East is a step that may lead for a more balanced U.S. policy toward the Middle East. حصل قدرا كبيرا من الاهتمام بأزمة الشرق الأوسط كأولوية. In addition, Mitchell's appointment, if finalized, means that the Middle East problem may become a priority issue on the agenda of the new U.S. administration. 75-year-old Mitchell is of Irish and Lebanese origin. His father is Irish and his mother is a Lebanese immigrant. Ula Matari, Al Arabiya.
turn to former Foreign Minister Likud M.K. Silvan Shalom. U.S. President Barack Obama's record in the Senate reveals strong support for Israel. Shalom added that he is confident the, uh, that Obama understands the complexities of the region. You know what the interests of the Israelis are, and I'm sure that when he's power now, he will realize that the fight in the Middle East is between the moderates, like Egypt, Jordan, the Palestinian Authority, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf states against the extremists led by Iran with Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Al-Qaeda. And joining us now in the studio to talk about the upcoming Obama era is former ambassador to the United States, Danny Ayalon. Ambassador Ayalon, thanks for coming in. Good to be here. Uh, you, of course, are running for a Knesset seat with uh, Yisrael Batenu, and the latest uh, public opinion polls show that the right-wing parties are doing better than the left-wing parties. If that trend continues, can we expect to see a right-wing Israeli government butting heads with a left-wing Obama administration <laughs> in the years to come? No, not at all. First of all, the first half is true. I would like to see a right-wing uh, coalition in Israel, which would really serve, uh, I think, Israel's uh, interests uh, well uh, at this time, but uh, not necessarily um, clashing with uh, Obama administration. First of all, I don't think it would be a leftist one. Uh, from everything I see, that he did after the election as president-elect and what he, uh, his rhetoric was, including uh, last night in the inauguration speech, he's going to govern from the center right there. And also, um, it seems like the strategy would really continue in really defeating international terrorism. He was very specific about this last night and also preventing uh, nuclearization of Iran. He didn't mention Iran by name, but this is the idea. So these are really the two main objectives of the American um, foreign policy, irrespective of who occupies the White House. Maybe the tactic, tactics will be a little bit different, with trying to be more coalition building and uh, maybe a dialogue to start with. But uh, by and large, I think that uh, so long as, I mean, with my experience, so long as the Americans understand our point of view, and we are not wishy-washy, and we are not keeping changing it, if we have red lines, then they would respect it, even if they will not completely agree. Ambassador Ayalon, toward that end, what do you make of Obama's selection of former Senator George Mitchell as his special Middle East envoy? Well, I've met the senator many times in Washington, but also when I was here, the foreign policy advisor of uh, former Prime Minister Sharon, he was the one actually that uh, chaired this international Mitchell committee. Right. that uh, included uh, some UN people and uh, European and others, and that they, he is the main composer of the, the report. So he's very much versed about the complexity of the, uh, the conflict. Um, I think as a uh, person, he is very um, effective in mm -hmm. what he does. I believe he uh, understands the Israeli concerns. And and they also have now, I mean, they now benefit from the experience. Eight years of Clinton, eight years of Bush, they all tried, they couldn't really make headways, not because of uh, incompetence on their part, it's because of the partner, which we do not have on the Palestinian side. Obama did mention in his uh, speech last night that he would work tirelessly to eliminate or reduce the nuclear threat, with more and more countries in this region talking about starting up nuclear programs, do you think he will have success in that area? Well, uh, in many ways he may have a better success than his predecessor because um, he may have a better legitimacy to act since he is starting, you know, like in a carte blanche, you know, he's turning a new page. Certainly it is the common interest of all the uh, secular Sunni regimes in the area. Certainly is the interest of the Europeans of the United States, the entire actually free world, and Israel as well as, as part of it, to stop Iran.
Most Arab Americans have very high hopes for the new president, Barack Hussein Obama. They hope that he will put an end to the crisis in the Middle East, most importantly, the Palestinian issue. They should be cautious of having such high hopes, especially after former Democratic President Bill Clinton failed to meet their expectations. Our reporter, Mohammed Al Alami, observed these expectations and hopes in Chicago and has provided us with the following report. Despite the fact that Obama refrained from saying anything in support of the Arabs and Muslims, the controversy over his name and religion has motivated Muslim and Arab communities in the U.S. to support him and to have high expectations towards his presidency, even if cautiously. In the year 2000, Obama said that the most oppressed people are the Palestinian people. In 2004, he went back on what he said, saying that the Palestinian leadership is incompetent. So let's just see what will happen, whether he will go back on what he said or continue. Those Arab Americans who were accustomed to only caring about the issue of the Middle East now have different concerns, especially with the economic crisis. We hope that Obama will improve the nation's economic situation, focus on the economy, stay away from war, and we hope that he improves both the Palestinian and Iraqi situations. And we also hope that he will perceive the Arab world in a more serious way. Those Arab Americans who insisted to bring part of their homeland to these Arab neighborhoods have learned from past experiences not to exaggerate their hopes. As you know, the most important issue to Arabs and Muslims is Palestine. In the past, we bet on Clinton. We exhausted ourselves and went to vote and nothing changed. My expectation from Obama are the same. It won't be very different. I am not saying that Obama is a magician who will repair everything and the economy in one day, because the economy is really suffering. The continuous disappointments that Arab Americans have faced made them have very poor expectations and hopes towards politicians, even in a new era at the White House with a president who carries an Arabic name, Mohammed Al-Alami Al Jazeera, from an Arab neighborhood in Chicago. Go. On the third day since the ceasefire went into effect, the Gaza Strip is completely empty of any Israeli military presence. This morning, Israeli tanks and machinery withdrew from the Gaza Strip. According to an Israeli military spokeswoman, the last Israeli soldier has left the Palestinian territories in the coastal enclave. However, the withdrawal doesn't mean that Israel has ended its military operations in Gaza. This comes after the spokeswoman for the Israeli military issued a statement saying that the army will always remain on the outskirts of Gaza to face any urgent situation. Early this morning, the last Israeli soldier. Early this morning, the last Israeli soldier has left the Gaza Strip. The Israeli forces were redeployed on the outskirts of Gaza, and they are ready for all the scenarios and possibilities. A delegation from the International Atomic Energy Agency is on its way to Gaza to investigate Israel's alleged use of weapons containing depleted uranium against the residents of the Gaza Strip. The UN inquiry comes in response to a request made by Saudi Arabia on behalf of the Arab delegations inside the IAEA. Meanwhile, the UN provided a list of five international dignitaries to preside over a UN follow-up committee to monitor human rights violations in Gaza. Among the names are former Finnish President Marti Atasari, former High Commissioner for Human Rights Mary Robinson, and former Commissioner of the UNRWA Peter Hansen. 
Ahead of these international maneuvers, the Israeli army is investigating what it described as the alleged use of white phosphorus bombs in Gaza. In what was attributed to Israeli military sources, Israel's Haaretz newspaper reported that the inquiry would focus on the alleged firing of about 20 phosphorus shells around the northern town of Beit Lahia by Israeli paratroopers. However, a spokesman for the Israeli army dismissed the report by Haaretz and added that no official inquiry has been launched regarding this matter. The UN Secretary of General Ban Ki-moon, who was shocked at the devastation in Gaza, conveyed the truth about the magnitude of the destruction to the infrastructure, public property and even institutions of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA. Ban Ki-moon talked with bitterness about what happened in Gaza and the suffering of its people and promised to exert maximum efforts to deal with the destruction. Ban Ki-moon called on Palestinian factions to reconcile and reiterated that the UN will work with any unified Palestinian government in order to rebuild Gaza. In the first visit of its kind, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon arrived in Gaza under tight security. During the visit, he inspected areas that have been damaged by the Israeli aggression, especially a school that was managed by the UN, which was damaged by Israeli bombardment and the headquarters of one of the international relief agencies. Ki-moon expressed shock at the destruction in Gaza caused by the Israeli aggression. I do not have any I don't have words to describe my feelings towards these humanitarian tragedies, the destruction of the infrastructure, and the suffering of the people. Thousands of Palestinians participated in mass demonstrations throughout Gaza in response to Hamas's call for holding victory celebrations. Palestinians carried flags and shouted slogans about what they called the resistance's victory and Israel's defeat feet in its war against Gaza. Israel has focused on killing children and women as well as destroying homes and buildings after failing to confront the resistance. Hamas is still Hamas. The resistance is still the same. It's even stronger than it's ever been. It enjoys wide public support after it had debunked the Zionist security scheme. The resistance has destroyed the myth that the Israeli army can't be defeated. Thanks to God the Great, the resistance is still in control and has the last word. The masses gathered outside the buildings that were attacked by Israeli planes, reiterating their support to the Palestinian resistance. Hamas said that this large turnout shows that Hamas still enjoys wide support and that it will stay committed to its resistance program. The movement also said that the withdrawal of the Israeli tanks and the unilateral declaration of ceasefire by Israel were due to the steadfastness of the resistance and the willingness to die in defending Gaza despite the large magnitude of destruction and despite the large number of martyrs. Truly, the level of destruction in Gaza is unimaginable. This is a mass murder and an attempt to kill every form of life. One cannot understand the level of destruction until he sees it with his own eyes. However, despite this destruction, and despite these difficulties, we will stay steadfast and we will not surrender. We will resist the occupation. Hamas's reiteration that they have won the battle coincides with Ki Moon's words of support to the people of Gaza. He vowed to work with the United Palestinian government in the West Bank and Gaza. So the question is will the Palestinian factions unite at this critical time? As the Israeli army withdraws from the Gaza Strip, the residents continue to uncover more tragedies due to the Israeli aggression. The following report tells the tale of two sisters who were executed in front of their father by the occupation army. It's a very long walk to Khalid's home, or better said, to the rubbles of Khalid's home, due to the massive destruction in the neighborhood. In front of this rubble, a criminal act of execution was committed against Khalid's two daughters, Suad and Amal. The story started when Khalid, his wife and their daughters came out of their home in compliance with an order by the Israeli army. Once outside the house, an Israeli soldier opened fire intentionally at two-year-old Amal and seven-year-old Suad, 
shattering their tiny bodies, just like this doll, which was riddled by the bullets of execution. My daughter Amal was holding this doll before she was murdered. The doll was torn into pieces after being hit by the fire of the Israeli army. I just want to know why did the Israeli army do this to my daughters? I was standing right here, yet the Israeli army did not open fire at me. It seems that the Israeli army wasn't satisfied by shooting Khalid's daughters, as they went ahead and demolished the family's home. We walked two kilometers from the home to reach an ambulance. We carried our murdered children. My daughters are gone and my home was demolished. We are now displaced, living on the street, as you can see. As soon as the Israeli withdrawal was completed, Khalid's wife rushed to the ruins of her home, searching for any memorable things of her daughters. However, all she could find was this dress and a certificate of school performance addressed to her older daughter. This is what's left of the memories of my daughters, Swad and Amal. We've looked for two straight days for anything to remind us of them, and this is the only thing we could find. We have recovered this dress from underneath the rubble. What else can we do? We rely on God's help and guidance as he is our rightful guide. This boy here is Rafat, the brother of the two slain sisters. Rafat's fate has taken him outside the home during the commission of the crime. After returning to his demolished home, the first thing Rafat did was to collect the bullets that were fired at his two sisters. The Israelis shot my sisters with these bullets. These bullets right here. I love my sisters. Since January 7, the day Amal and Suad were executed, every day their father has returned to his demolished home. In each step he takes, Khalid asks, what did Amal and Suad do to have their lives taken away after being shot 12 times each? This question was asked by Khalid. Is there anyone who can provide an answer to him? Ever since the war on Gaza ended, everyday Gazans have been discovering a new tragedy that is more heinous in nature than the previous one. Here, where I'm standing right now, a criminal act of execution was committed, burying with it the memories of Khalid and his daughters underneath the rubble of their home. Ezra Bahasi Alalam from the Abed Rabu neighborhood, the eastern Gaza Strip. In your opinion, Mr. Tariq, do you think the issue of Palestine will become a priority for Obama after the events in Gaza, or do you think that Afghanistan is the priority, as Barack Obama has said before? In reality, Obama came to the White House based on an election agenda. This agenda included many regional and international issues. On the top of his list is the domestic economic situation, the situations in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Along with other issues, Obama is facing a new challenge, which is Gaza. This challenge will impose on Obama to reassess his priorities, although Gaza is not an important part of his internal political agenda. I think that he will come up with a policy of change towards Gaza because he wants change, especially that his slogan is all about change. This change will impose itself on Obama to face up to the challenges in Gaza, not according to the way past presidents have dealt with it as part of Israeli security. This makes me think that Obama is obligated. However, this does not mean that he will change his agenda. It was obvious that he was silent at the beginning for a long time. This silence regarding the massacres that took place in Gaza was strange to many people. Then he recently described what is happening as a disaster. The appealing thing is that he did not condemn the monstrous Israeli massacres and at the same time he did not condemn Hamas and lay the responsibility on them the way the Bush administration did. How is this view interpreted? He was not biased, nor did he side with Israel or Hamas. We cannot assume that Obama is innocent from the Gazan blood. 
At the same time, we must realize that this is the first time in U.S. history that a black man comes to the White House as president. This means that this black man will be facing many challenges from the Israeli lobby and the military-industrial complex that influences most American institutions, especially because we know that the president does not rule in America. America is ruled by institutions. There are two options, either that Obama was completely complacent to the issue of Gaza, as many have confirmed, or that he wanted to wait until the events in Gaza ended, because if he spoke before he became president of the United States, then the Israeli lobby would have held it against him. Therefore, I said that Obama is going to face challenges, because if he really wants to change the American foreign policy, then he must condemn what happened in Gaza. If he does not condemn what happened in Gaza for a long time, and if he does what Ban Ki-moon did today, where he compared what happened in Ashdod to what happened in Gaza, then this will mean that Obama will not come with anything new in terms of foreign policy. The weapons of destruction and killing have become the basic material of an art project about life, tolerance and freedom. We leave you with the report of Lula al-Tamir. Iraqi artists are exhibiting artwork they made out of pieces of weapons, including this machine gun, which was transformed into a flying insect. This rifle was transformed into an ancient Egyptian queen. Graduates of the art department at Baghdad's university have started this project last year. They say they have transformed objects that brought destruction to Iraq into pieces of art. Artist Haider Muwaffaq used pieces of guns and iron bars to make artwork resembling an old neighborhood in Baghdad. We are very proud of the artwork because we are conveying a positive image about the Iraqi society to the world. We are saying that Iraq is okay, it has creative art. This is a message from our beloved Baghdad to the world. We are still alive and we are transforming these weapons of destruction that have been used all over the world, not only in Baghdad, into artwork. We are using these weapons which killed a lot of people and harmed many families. It is unlikely that these artists will run out of pieces of weapons to use in their artwork. Every single day, the Iraqi Organization for Removing Landmines destroys about 800 pieces of weapons, including Kalashnikov rifles and mortar shells that were collected by the American forces during the security campaigns. The president of the organization, Ziham Jihad Murtada, talked about the idea of transforming weapon parts into pieces of art. In this project, we transform pieces of weapons, which were used for bloodshed, killing and destruction, into artwork about life, art, tolerance and freedom. Inside a small workshop in Baghdad, one sees a sculpture of a cowboy in real size holding two real guns. He was made out of the remains of missile launchers. Next to him, there is a fish that was made out of old pieces of metal and a robot that looks like a human being. There is also a bust representing the ancient Egyptian queen Nefertiti. Iraqi artists and the Iraqi Organization for Removing Landmines will hold a public exhibit in April to display these artworks. The generated revenues will go to institutions that take care of children who were injured by explosives and landmines, as the artist Ali Hamid was putting the last touches on a sculpture of a motorcycle, he said, our motto is, goodbye to weapons. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. 
Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.